it should not shock anybody that your big old giant brain is in control of your breathing rates, okay? We have mentioned um, the cardiovascular centers in several recordings. Now we're going to chat about your respiratory center that is also found in your medulla oblongata and your pons. Okay, so we're adding a part of your brain stem here. We didn't really mention your pons when we talked about cardiovascular. Your respiratory center controls you, the rhythm of your respiration through your phrenic nerve. Okay, your phrenic nerve uh, innervates your good old diaphragm. Okay. Normal uh, resting respiratory rate. So you just sitting in your chair, relaxing, reading a book listening to your lectures, listening to your favorite music, it's going to be about 12 to 15 breaths per minute. Okay, this is referred to as eupnea, which is kind of a funny word to say. Um, this rate will vary person to person. It's just average, about 12 to 15 breaths a minute. Okay. The medulla oblongata itself is primarily responsible for controlling your ventilation. Okay. Um, or controlling eupneum, while your pons instead influences the rhythm of your respiration. And we'll differentiate that a little bit more here in just a little bit. Okay. So your inspiratory center, okay, you have neurons here that discharge impulses for about two seconds. Okay, so they'll fire for about two seconds. And this leads to contraction of the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. You know those as your inspiratory muscles. Okay. Contraction of the breathing muscles, um, we have already learned, will increase your thoracic cavity volume. This will decrease the pressure okay, within your thoracic cavity. All of that allows air to rush in to your lungs during inhalation. Okay, So kind of tying uh, in a few things that we learned last time. We just mentioned that your phrenic nerve innervates your diaphragm. Okay. You have intercostal nerves. It will not shock you to learn that your intercostal nerves innervate your external intercostal muscles. Okay. Both of the nerves also supply a little bit um, of innervation to some of your accessory muscles, uh, both inspiration and expiration as well. But these are your main two nerves that innervate your main two um, breathing muscles, okay? So we said the inspiratory center neurons are gonna fire for about two seconds. After those two seconds, okay, your inspiratory nerves are gonna become inactive for three seconds. So they're gonna switch and they're just gonna hang out for a minute, okay? And by minute, I mean three seconds. That's all we get here, okay? That's the amount of time that you need for expiration. And during those three seconds, your inspiratory muscles relax, your lungs do recoil, Remember, this is most, mostly a passive process. You're not really using any ATP. You're just relaxing your muscles, okay? And then you just do it all over again. It's a cycle, okay? So we had two seconds of firing, and then we had three seconds of inactivation. And we do two more seconds of firing. We do three more seconds of relaxation or inactivation, okay? This is where we get the 12 to 15 breaths per minute, okay? Two seconds on, three seconds off. Okay, so it's about five seconds in total. Your expiratory neurons, okay, because you do have expiratory neurons as well. These are inactive during normal or quote unquote quiet breathing. Okay, uh, they do become active during heavy breathing. These neurons will then send impulses um, that cause your accessory respiratory muscles to contract. This should be accessory, I'll add a Y there. Accessor, that's not a word, <laughs> okay. Um, your accessory respiratory muscles were the ones involved in the forceful expiration. So if you remember your internal intercostals and your abdominal muscles, okay. So that's who's getting signals from your expiratory neurons. Again, that's just during heavy breathing. Just a picture, just to remind you, your medulla, okay. We're gonna send signals to your uh, inter, inter, intercostal nerves. We're also going to send signals through your phrenic nerve to your diaphragm. Okay. Um, again, both of these are your uh, inspiratory reserves. Okay. And then 
You can also sing signals um, for forced expiration during heavy breathing as well. Okay, so we mentioned eupnea or good breathing. Okay, um, it will not shock you to learn that there's also abnormal or bad breathing. Okay, dyspnea would be shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. Apnea is the absence of breathing, uh, which is terrifying. Uh, a lot of people suffer from sleep apnea, so you basically stop breathing for short periods of time during your sleep. I find that to be absolutely terrifying. Um, hyperpnea, hyperventilation, and hypoventilation. So hyperpnea is forceful breathing. Okay, um, it also includes the forceful exhalation that we do during exercises. Okay. Hyperventilation would be any respiration um, faster than the normal 12 to 15 breaths a minute. Hypoventilation would be slower than 12 to 15 breaths per minute. Um, some of the main causes for hyperventilation, hypocapnia, respiratory alkalosis, and uh, hyperoxia. Okay, So hypocapnia um, is basically you do not have enough carbon dioxide in your body, which I know that sounds weird, but you can have too little. Okay. Um, having too little carbon dioxide um, affects your pH of your blood. It is one of the things that can lead to respiratory alkalosis. So alkalosis um, is your blood pH has gotten too high. Okay, and carbon dioxide is one of the direct things that affects your blood pH. Okay, so these two are very, very linked. Um, and then hyperoxia, this one's also gonna sound weird. Hyperoxia is basically um, high levels of oxygen. We don't normally think about um, being able to have too much oxygen. We don't really normally think about being able uh, or drinking like too much water, things like that. We just know that, hey, you know, we need to drink water. Hey, we need oxygen. And that's true, but we keep saying, you know, too much of a good thing is never a good thing. And here's another example of that. Okay, so hyperoxia is also bad. Now, hypoventilation, um, the effects or the causes of these are basically the opposite. We get hypercapnia, so too much CO2, um, respiratory acidosis, so our pH has gotten too low, uh, which could be caused by having too much CO2 in the body, and then hypo, uh, hypoxia, which is too little oxygen floating around. Okay, So basically, we've got the opposites going on here respiratory acidosis and alkalosis we're going to talk a lot about those y'all make sure you highlight those all right we have briefly mentioned chemoreceptors before here we are we're going to bring them up again and we're going to go into a little bit more detail about these um, one of the things that helps regulate your respiratory centers and uh, therefore adjust your respiration rates are the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide in your body we have two different uh, types of chemoreceptors, central and peripheral chemoreceptors. Your central chemoreceptors, these are the ones in the medulla itself, and they detect changes in carbon dioxide levels of your cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, Remember, your medulla is part of your brain, so it makes sense that we would be monitoring cerebrospinal fluid here. Peripheral chemoreceptors, however, these are located in your aortic arch and your carotid arteries. These are detecting quite a few extra things. Um, first of all, if we're talking about your arteries, we are monitoring your things in your blood instead of your cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and it does, they, or they do, also measure carbon dioxide levels, but in addition, they also detect hydrogen ion levels as well as oxygen concentration levels. So your peripheral chemoreceptors, not only are they in a different place, but they're monitoring a different body fluid. And we have two additional substances that we are checking the levels of. So they have um, a couple extra tasks that they have to complete. So when we monitor your arterial uh, blood for all of these um, concentrations of substances, it's carbon dioxide. And it's very common, and I didn't point that out, and excuse me, these big P's, okay? These P's are gonna show up a lot. These are basically, um, we call them partial pressures, and we are going to go into a lot of detail about partial pressures. But just in case you were wondering what the big P's were, okay? They're not typos, they are supposed to be there, okay? Um, so the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, which is basically just how much carbon dioxide or how much oxygen, how much hydrogen ions. So how much CO2, okay? This is the most powerful stimulus, okay? 
that induces a negative feedback loop okay from your central chemoreceptors okay so now that we know what the p's are for one more time arterial okay pco2 okay so how much carbon dioxide you have in your blood is the most powerful stimulus that starts a negative feedback loop okay your high carbon dioxide levels okay? or it could be high hydrogen concentration levels okay of your arterial blood okay could be both could have lots of carbon dioxide and could have lots of hydrogens okay these are going to trigger hyperventilation okay your body has too much co2 okay how do we get rid of co2 we breathe out so if we have too much co2 it should make sense that we would want to increase respiration to increase the amounts of co2 that we're going to get rid of okay your respiratory center is stimulated okay we increase the ventilation rates this will ultimately lower your carbon dioxide and or your hydrogen ion levels back to homeostasis now we could have the opposite going on we could have low amounts of carbon dioxide or hydrogen okay or again or both this would trigger hypoventilation okay your respiratory center is now going to be inhibited okay it's going to say hey we don't have enough of this around this will decrease your ventilation rate which will ultimately increase your carbon dioxide and your hydrogen ion levels returning them to homeostasis okay so you already know it's not a great thing to have too much carbon dioxide in your blood well if we do let's get rid of it how do we get rid of it we hyperventilate well now you know that you could actually have too little carbon dioxide in your blood as well if that's the case how are we going to keep some of that carbon dioxide around a little bit low a little bit longer we're going to slow down our breathing rates Okay. Uh, and here's just our picture so if we increase how much carbon dioxide our chemoreceptors detect that um, your respiratory center will stimulate your um, breathing pathways and we will hyperventilate and we've got our picture for what happens if uh, we don't have enough co2 central chemoreceptors will be um, inhibited we will not uh, be stimulating quite as much and that will reduce ventilation will hypoventilate all right your good old peripheral chemoreceptors okay. these remember are found in your carotid arteries and your aorta okay sometimes um, you might hear the terms carotid bodies and aortic bodies same thing okay so just in case you see those those terms somewhere um, we mentioned that they do detect a wider variety of stimuli so they don't just do pco2 they also do uh, hydrogens they also do oxygens okay and these little guys your carotid arteries and your aorta chemoreceptors peripheral receptors okay these are most sensitive to oxygen itself okay in your arterial blood okay so when your oxygen levels fall below about 70 millimeters of mercury okay which normal is 100 okay so if we fall to 70 okay this is going to trigger an increase in ventilation rate and depth so we're going to breathe faster and we're going to breathe deeper we're going to bring in all that oxygen we can because your body has detected that we are a little too low on oxygen okay all right summary slide real quick okay um, we mentioned your receptors okay we didn't really talk about how your emotions affect your breathing rate but uh, if you remember the last time you ugly cried okay think of how your breathing changed and that will probably make sense as well okay. so just take a look at this make sure it's making sense <laughs>